Hey friends out there. Uh, this is Sally McCabe from the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society's Community Education uh, Division. And today we're talking about timing and what we should be doing now, whether we should be planting things from seeds, from plants, from magically pulling them out of the sky, all of the different things that we need to do timeline. Uh, I want to introduce Nate Kleinman. He is uh, my good friend and cohort in crime in the berry picking business, but he is the executive director of the Experimental Farm Network, and I'm going to let him talk a little bit about that. And he is also the moving force behind the Cooperative Gardens Commission, which is a new national slash international group that formed as part of the COVID-19 um, pandemic reaction to try to get people around the world to grow more food for other people. I'm going to talk to you about timing in the garden. Right now, we are, we are one day, one and a half days into summer. What does that mean now out in our gardens? Well, right now it's 90 degrees. Last night here in Philadelphia, it rained like the Dickens. And so we've got nice wet soil. We've got nice warm temperatures. That tells me that because we're in a situation that's akin to the tropics, it's time to make sure our tropical plants are planted. The question is, when is it too late to start planting all of these things? And when is it too early to get our cool stuff in? And what can we be planting right now from seed? What should we be planting from, from transplants? So this is our, um, this is our crib sheet. So what, what we've got here, um, we have what we should be planting this time of year and what our deadlines are. Pretty much we've got to get all of our tropical stuff in before uh, the 4th of July. That's a good cutoff for us here in zone seven. I know there are some people out there that are not in zone seven, so you need to know when your frost dates are because we're gonna do some math. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about doing the math um, afterward, but I want you to see on this chart what it is we can be growing, what, what it is we can be planting right now. And um, you can read in your hymnals along with me. We've got to get in our tomatoes, our peppers, our squash, eggplant, cucumbers, melons, beans, and sweet potatoes. We've got to get them in before the 4th of July because otherwise we're playing with not getting our fruit ripe at the other end of the season, especially if we get an early frost. So um, then we take a little bit of a break. We take a break between say the 4th of July and into August because it's just so freaking hot out there and um, an awkward time to be starting things because it's too late to be starting the tropicals and it's too early to be starting the cool season things. So what we're doing in that time is mostly maintenance in our garden. We're gonna talk about that also in a little bit. Um, after, and when, we when, when we're still doing workshops in August, you'll be here, I hope, and um, we'll talk about getting our, um, our fall crops started, but then we start in around August and up until October, that's when we're starting the things like we can plant collards again, radishes, carrots, turnips, the greens, and then our heading crops like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, those things. But we don't wanna be planting them now because it's just too hot and the ground is too hot. And uh, we don't, we, we wanna wait. But um, in that little piece of time, what we can be doing is we can be starting things indoors. So we might start um, our fall crops indoors. Why would we do it indoors instead of outdoors? Well, because we can actually maintain the temperature better indoors. And these are plants that need lots of, um, they need ventilation, so they need to be kept cooler than 90 degrees as they're, as they're starting. So we could be starting um, our fall crops of collards, um, the broccoli, cauliflower, um, cabbage, those, those cold crops we could be putting in 
indoors to get little transplants so that come August, when it's starting to, starting to cool down a little bit, which is kind of a joke, it's not really, but um, that's when we wanna start getting them in the ground. So in the time between the 4th of July and the 1st of August, that's when we're starting to do our things indoors. The train is coming. So um, have we found Nate yet? I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I would like to um, to let Nate talk a little bit about um, first. I want him to talk a little bit about the experimental farm network, and um, and then a little bit about the community gardens, uh, the the cooperative gardens commission, and then I want you to know that this guy is a pro and he's a farmer, and so he knows all of this stuff. So he knows uh, how important timing is in all of the stuff that we're growing. So I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, sing your own praises there, Nate. Go <laughs> Thanks, Sally. I'm glad I got the memo about wearing purple today, too. Um, so uh, my name is Nate Kleinman, and um, as Sally said, I, I, um, I'm co-director, actually, of the Experimental Farm Network. Uh, we're a nonprofit that's based in Philadelphia. Um, sorry, you're on my phone now, because the computer wasn't working. Um, we're based in Philadelphia, but I farm in South Jersey in a town called Elmer. Um, we are, our purpose is to uh, facilitate collaboration on sustainable ag research. So that means we have a website, experimentalfarmnetwork.org. And at that website, we, um, Anybody can create a project and recruit volunteers to help them out on their project. A lot of what we do are plant breeding projects, especially with a focus on developing perennial crops that can help us uh, transition our farming system to one that will help fight climate change instead of being one that drives climate change as the current system does. So we're working on things like perennial grains, perennial oil seeds, um, things like that. And uh, we also are a seed company. So if you're interested in um, seeing the seeds that we, that we offer, a lot of them are heirlooms from, from the Philadelphia area, uh, like the old Campbell's soup tomato. Um, we have a uh, Nanticoke squash we sell from the Nanticoke people in Delaware and, and New Jersey and Maryland. Um, that website is efnseeds.com. And then, uh, as Sally mentioned, I, when the pandemic started, I um, helped to form a, uh, something called the Cooperative Gardens Commission. And you can find that website at coopgardens.com. It's um, basically the purpose is to, to help people get the resources that they need to grow more food this year. We realized early on there, there was going to be a shortage of seeds as people were panic buying seeds, just like they were panic buying food. Um, and then obviously the regular supply chain disruptions that are going on um, are, are really troubling. And with the general economic downturn, all the people who are um, relying on, on aid to get, uh, to get the food that they need, uh, we figured as many people as we could get to grow food, the better. So we've been, uh, one of our big projects was taking in donations of seeds from seed companies around the country and then shipping them to seed hubs around the around the country. We have about 250. We think that the donations we took in will um, will end up in about 10,000, maybe 12,000 gardens this year. Um, and that was all uh, organized out of a closed bookstore in West Philly primarily. Um, so that's the basics. And uh, like I said, I farm down here in South Jersey. Uh, I don't get good reception there, so I so I came home. Um, but uh, there's some beautiful stuff growing at the farm this year, um, and uh, uh, yeah, as Sally said, it's berry season too. So I I have like black raspberry stains on my hands and stuff. <laughs> so Nate, what is it that you are? Um, what are what zone are you in Elmer? Zone seven. It's pretty much the same zone as most of Philadelphia. We're in a cold spot here in South Jersey. There are places that are a little warmer on either side of us. So um, what is it that you're still planting? What have you planted in this two week period or are about to plant? Um, I am, I, I pretty much just finished things out. I have one more thing to put in the ground as far as the starts. I have um, some basil starts that I haven't put in the ground yet. 
and they'll be fine. Basil, basil can handle it warm as long as you pinch the top off so that it produces more leaves. Uh, I recently put some, um, some tomatoes in the ground, some eggplants and some peppers. Uh, those are all things that I started months ago, uh, but they're doing well right now. Um, I'm still planting some seeds. I planted seeds for some, some more tropical type uh, legumes like cow peas and mung beans. Um, I know those aren't very typical garden crops, although cow peas are a wonderful dual use crop, also known as black eyed peas, but you can eat the leaves. They're very rich in protein. They taste good raw or, or cooked. Um, you can eat the pods like green beans. You can eat the beans when they're still ripening. Definitely recommend that one. And um, I just planted a little bit of sorghum as well, which is getting late, but I wanted to get it in the ground. Thank you. So what, um, what I would like, I wanna follow up on something that Nate just said, and that's about planting, uh, planting transplants. So here's my, um, my basil plant, which has been in the pot, but it's gonna go into the ground. And what, uh, what Nate had said was, He's pinching the tops out. So I'm going to pinch out a little bit more than the top. I'm going to pinch down to the first good branch because this is going to be in the dinner tonight. Um, what that means is that the each little node, each little word, word that I want, um, this little axle, like this little branching is going to put out another branch and another branch. And so I'll get a much bushier plant than if I put it in the ground now because chances are good I'm gonna stress it out and then it's gonna to try to go straight up and gonna to try to bloom. I don't want it to do that. So again, I'm taking this off at a, at a juncture. I'm taking the top off so that this can go this way and this way. And again, this one goes in the dinner. So, thank you. What I wanted to talk about is math and gardening and how you have to do the math to know when is the latest time that you can plant something. So Nate, you're in zone seven. So you usually get a frost because you're, way, you're way removed from the city. So you probably get a frost around Halloween. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair bet. Sometimes before, sometimes a couple weeks after. So we get, um, in the old days, we were pretty reliably gonna get a frost around Halloween. But because the city is made up of micro, little microclimates, like if you're close to a building or you're close to a parking lot or close to a lot of concrete, you might get a frost much later because those different um, situations that you're in radiate a lot of heat back. Um, so if you're next to a building, the building is absorbing the heat and it could keep you from, it could give you an extra two weeks, maybe even an extra month of growing season. But what we do for our calculations is we figure on Halloween, uh, October the 31st or November the 1st um, as our count backward day. Because we wanna have everything well bearing by then. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look, I'm gonna sort of pick up a random seed pack. And you all know what a seed pack looks like. And um, I, I pretty much use the seed pack as my, as my gospel. Um, this one is okra, Clemson spineless. It tells me a little bit about what I'm growing, uh, which is a high producer of dark green pointed pods without spines. Yes, you don't like the spines. So what I'm, is important to me is it says 56 days to harvest. So I am going to take my calendar and uh, you know what a cal you don't have to close up on this because you know what a calendar looks like. I'm going to look at October. October. Here's October. I am going to count back 56 days. How many weeks would that be? Oh, I'm waiting for a reply, and everybody's muted. So um, 56 uh, would be divided by seven, eight, eight weeks, weeks, two months. So I'm going to go backward eight weeks. So I'm going to go all of October and all of September. And then I'm going to give myself an extra couple of weeks. Uh, so that means that all the way back into August is the very latest that I can get something in. Because 56 days, if I say in 56 days, I'm going to get my first fruit, I want to count back well before 56 days. But 
Everybody nod and say that that made sense or shake your head and say it didn't make sense. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of nods. So that's as complicated as the math gets. Now, unfortunately, there are still crops out there that I want that are 120 days. Some of the sweet potatoes that I really, really love, 120 days. So guess what? 120 days is how many, how many weeks? Let's say how many months? Four months. So all of October, all of September, all of August, and all of July, which means that I've got about five minutes to get my sweet potatoes in if I'm going to get sweet potatoes in 120 days. So you that's got, you got a solid up. week. You got a week to do sweet potatoes. I haven't I haven't planted my sweet potatoes yet either. Shame I'm, you, neither. I'm, so um, <laughs> I'm going to race you. I'm going to get mine in by Thursday. You'll probably win. Yeah. So um, okay. Um, well, we'll give you a little credit because we know you're busy. But I have. I'm planting. I think I'm planting five different kinds of sweet potatoes, like 100 and 150 plants. So it's going to be a lot. Okay. All right. Well, maybe I'll help you. Maybe I'll come. Maybe we'll all bring the whole class down, put our masks on, keep our distance, and help you plant your tomatoes. I mean, your sweet potatoes. <laughs> But one thing about sweet potatoes also that another, that's, that's another crop that most people don't know that you can eat the leaves and the leaves are delicious. You can cook them, you can eat them raw. Some varieties taste a little better than others, but they're all edible. The growing tips, the, the youngest leaves are the tastiest. And, um, and, if, you, and if, you, if you cheat and you only have 100 days or 90 days left of the season yet, you're still going to get sweet potatoes. They're just going to be smaller than if they'd had a whole time, 120 to mature. Well, I um, we're going to come back to the edible leaves in a minute, but I, I have to tell you, I did know that. Um, <laughs> I learned that I was in a garden in West Philadelphia with some Liberian women, and they were going, they had the sweet potatoes growing in a whole bed, and they were going and breaking off the stems and sticking them in the ground, and breaking off the stems and sticking them in the ground breaking them off the stems and sticking them to the ground. And I said, when do you get the potatoes? How do you get potatoes if you keep doing that all summer? And they looked at me and they said, potatoes? They said, no, we eat the leaves. So they were growing them mainly for the leaves and the potatoes, which aren't really potatoes, but they're sweet potatoes, that were growing under the ground were what they saved to plant again next year. So that they did not eat them, they saved them to replant the following year. So uh, I ate a lot of, I've been eating a lot, <coughs> eating a lot of sweet potatoes since then. I saw we have some good, um We have some good sweet potato questions and comments <laughs> that people are dropping in the chat. Well, so Cassidy, Young well. Mai is here today and she's saying that um, she eats the sweet potato leaves too. And if you try to buy them from the Asian market, they're actually expensive. So it sounds like you're better off growing well, them on your what? own. Um, and then Peggy is wondering, um, is it just sweet potatoes that you can eat the leaves or is it any potato? Well, Nate, just what, else sweet potato. what else do you eat the leaves of? Well, first I want to be clear, only eat the sweet potato leaves. Regular potato leaves are poisonous. They are no good. Sweet potatoes and potatoes are very, very different. Uh, sweet potato is actually a kind of morning glory, believe it or not. Uh, and you'll notice the flowers, if you ever see a sweet potato flower, they have these pretty morning glory flowers. Um, also, Asian markets will sometimes carry something that they call water spinach, which is actually a type of sweet potato that lives in water, and it has hollow stem, and is really, really delicious. You can also, if you find that at an Asian market, you can just take the stems, put them in water, and start growing them yourselves in a bathtub or something. That's where they'll do the best. But they get another, a potato thing. It doesn't make much of a tuber, no. Um, but it, but the leaves are delicious, and that's often the most expensive vegetarian item on a menu if you go to a Vietnamese restaurant in in South Philly. Um, and sometimes they don't even have it. It's a seasonal delicacy. But one of the other favorite leaves that people don't realize they should be eating. <laughs> are uh, squash leaves. A lot of people know that you can eat the squash flowers, but especially the growing tips of the squash, that curled up part where all the leaves are miniature and the little tendrils, that's a really delicious vegetable. You can chop it up and put it in soups. 
Um, it's more common. It's actually sometimes available in Asian markets. Uh, there are Asian folks who eat that, but it's a, it's more common a food in uh, Mexican cooking. But uh, it's a very simple, it's a very easy um, stock, like a vegetable plant, um, pot herb for, for putting in soups or stir fries. You wouldn't want to eat it raw because it has those tiny little bristly hairs on it. Uh, but as soon as you put it in boiling water or expose it to heat, those things disappear and it ends up with quite a nice texture, good flavor, sucks up the flavor of other things. And uh, from what I've read, it's pretty nutritious as well. Um, were there other things that you would eat? That, you said um, the, leave, the leaves of the cow peas, the black eyed peas? Yeah, the cow peas. I don't know of other legumes that you want to eat the leaves of, but I know cow peas are delicious. Um, now, I, I like eat pea sprouts and small pea leaves. Oh yeah, pea leaves are great. Um, there's actually a new variety of pea available called Petite Snap Greens uh, from a company called Calvin's Peas. And they bred a pea that instead of having tendrils, like regular tendrils that grab onto things, it produces it, what looks like a tendril, but then at the end of all of them are, are little leaves instead of tendrils. And uh, so it's, a, it's like an extra leafy um, pea, really, really tasty. Um, I like, I actually like okra leaves. You can eat okra leaves as well. Um, but yes, do not eat regular potato leaves, only sweet potato. <laughs> um, Broccoli leaves are potatoes. good too. I wanted to ask you a question. Um, I, my potatoes, I got them in the ground the first week of April, which I thought was a perfectly fine time. Um, so two questions. One is, can we continue to plant potatoes over the course of the summer? Sure, potatoes. Because I found a bag that never got planted and I'm mortified. So I'm thinking I'm gonna put them in the ground. Yeah, it's not too late. I, I just planted some potatoes last week. They might not give you the same yield as you would get if you got them in the ground earlier. But I, I'll get the little, I'll get little guys, won't I? But you'll still, yeah, you'll still get potatoes. Okay. Um, one of the comments that reminded me, almost all of the root crops that you're gonna possibly grow, you can eat the leaves on those too. And they're often quite good. Things like turnips, uh, rutabagas. Rutabaga leaves are, taste like kale, like red, red Russian kale. Um, you can even eat carrot leaves. Most people don't think to. And there are, um, but there are some varieties of carrots that were bred just for the leaves in Central Asia. Uh, beet greens obviously are, are really good. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the only one you don't, probably wouldn't be eating is parsnip greens. Some people have a, a, an allergic reaction to parsnip leaves. So even just ripping them up with bare hands can cause irritation. So we should rip them with our bare hands to see if they irritate us before we eat them? Just once, sure. Okay, just once. <laughs> okay, the other potato question I had for you, since you're Mr. Mr. Farmer and we have you captive, um, I have noticed that on some of my potatoes, I have flowers and now the flowers have made tiny little tomatoey looking things. Tell me about them. That's a great question. And I just made a post about that on uh, our Instagram page earlier this week. Um, those are called potato berries. And uh, potato is a cousin of a tomato and an eggplant. So that it's not a surprise that they look like little green tomatoes. Um, those are also poisonous. You don't want to eat them just because they have the name berry in them. But inside those potato berries are uh, individual little seeds. And um, each of those seeds will grow a new potato plant. Um, but you know, you've know you probably never grown potatoes that way because most people grow potatoes from clones. You're, you're growing another potato so that you get one that's identical to the one that you had before. But if we wanna get new different varieties of potato, we need more people to be planting the seeds and uh, if you do that, you're a, you're a potato breeder. Um, Sandra asked our Instagram address. It's Experimental Farm Network. That's uh, all one word on Instagram. That's as many letters as they let you have in a handle. If I um, opened up one of those green uh, potato berries right now and put the seeds in the ground, if they looked ripe to me, would I get anything this year or is that a next year thing? It's probably a next year thing, although you might end up the way you want to start true potato seed, they call them 
they call it TPS, uh, true potato seed. You start them just like you would start tomatoes and on the same basic schedule as you would start tomatoes. We surface sow them on a regular seed starting medium, keep it moist, keep it warm, um, and then it grows up and it's this tiny little plant that looks almost like a little tomato plant, but some usually has more rounded leaves like potato. Uh, but when um, the ones that I grew this year, a number of them had little tubers developing in the plug, in the, in the flat, in the greenhouse. So I put them in the ground with little tubers forming already. So if you did start some now, they, they're a little slower to germinate than a tomato. You probably wouldn't get any seeds until, I don't know, July 4th. You wouldn't get any seedlings till July 4th or so and they'd be big enough to put in the ground by late July. So yeah, you, you, probably, could, you probably could get some tubers out of that if you tried it. Um, but it's also better because they don't often ripen on the plant, those potato berries. It's usually advisable to harvest the berry and then let it sit on a counter for a couple of weeks before you take the berries out because the seeds will continue ripening. And then you would uh, store them the same as you would store pota uh, tomato seeds? Yeah, just store them dry. You don't have to do the fermentation thing. You just have to basically squeeze them out and uh, and then dry them out and keep them dry, keep them, keep them okay. out of the sun. So are there other things that you're saving the seeds of now or is that mostly a fall? Um, I just harvested rhubarb seeds the other day. Uh, rhubarb sends up their flower spikes and, and they're coming. Uh, there's some garden cress seeds that are just coming. Um, some biennial crops like kale um, would be uh, already, they're, they're almost ready to, to harvest. Uh, we grow something called Dietrich's Wild Broccoli Rob, which is one of our favorite crops. I harvested those seeds almost a month ago. Is that, that's a, will that reseed itself or do you have to save the seeds from that? That is self-seeding, but we, we sell seeds for that, so I have to collect a whole bunch in order to have them to you sell. Have to. But I didn't plant any this year. All I do is I, I weed around them where they're grow where they're not in in uh, you know um, where they're not coming up where they're going to cause a problem for another plant. So I have a bunch of parts of the farm right now where I see good patches of the wild broccoli rob coming up. Even though I didn't have them there last year, the seeds are just underground, and when they when the ground gets turned up, they grow. Now um, that's one of the things that I uh, I have. Um many years ago, uh, I've been in this house for five, si almost 16 years, and one of the early um, early years I planted mustard, um, and the mustard bolted, went right to seed, and it dropped seeds, and so every year I have not had to plant mustard um, in 15 years, because every year as it bolts and it goes to seed, the seeds drop, and I clean the plants out, shake the seeds down onto the ground, and that starts to come up in the, it comes up in the fall when the ground is cooler, and it stays there all winter, and I eat um, mustard greens all winter as, as one, of my, one of my salad greens. So I'm grateful for that, and I am um, very much wanting to get this uh, Dietrich's Wild Broccoli Rob going um, in my ground as well. So that's, that's on my checklist coming up. I'll save you some pods. Pardon? I'll save you some seed pods. Thank you. I think actually um, I got some from you last year and I never got them in the ground. So <laughs> there's always this year. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, and Nate chime in, Cassidy, you chime in too. Um, I wanted to talk about when we are starting our, when we're putting plants in and it's this hot and it's summer and the days aren't going to get any longer. In fact, now they're going to start to get shorter. Um, what do we need to remember when we are planting transplants? Um, I have here for our, uh, for our audience, uh, for our contestants, um, I have peppers, I have pepper plants. And um, I noticed on some of them, not on these that I have here, I noticed that I have little baby, um, they've already tried to form um, peppers. They have flowers, the flowers have made little, um, and so I'm very careful with these and the tomatoes to pick off all of the flowers and all of the fruit because I want this plant to instantly get 
to, to work on the roots. I wanted to not be worrying about the fruit just yet. I wanted to get good roots down because the soil is hot and if it doesn't rain an inch a week, these plants are gonna be under stress if I don't water them. So I wanna make sure that when I, um, when I dig a hole, I'm gonna add a little compost to it. And I'm also gonna water the hole first, then put the plant down in and then cover it and water it again. Because that way I know a, that there are, there's water down all the way at the bottom most roots, so I'm not going to be stressing them. And I water on top because I want to make sure that there are no air pockets in there for the, um, for the roots to dry out on the sides. So that's important if you're still, because if you're getting tomatoes now, chances are good they are full of, um, the plants are full of, if you're buying transplants or somebody's giving you their transplants that have been in the pots for too long, chances are very good that they have fruit or flowers or both on them. You need to get them off. Same thing with squash and cucumbers and all of those other, um, anything that you're putting in that's fruiting, get the flowers off it, get the fruit off it, give it a chance to put down roots and then let it go to, um, to fruit. Um, so that's the important thing about, um, about transplants. Um, I always try to put some spent compost in the hole with it, and I always try to put some compost on, on top as well. Now, if I'm going to be planting seeds, um, is there anything that you think it's too late to plant from seed, Nate? It's, pro it's probably too late for peppers, tomatoes, eggplant. I, still have, I do have tomato plants that are coming up. They're little seedlings coming up in my compost bin. I'm going to take a chance on them and put them in the ground because they've already germinated. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. But Those are fine, but, I would, but if you were starting from seed, it might be two weeks before they germinate. Yeah. I would probably hold off. And I wouldn't bother with, with cold, cold loving crops right now like uh, spinach, I mean, you, you could have spinach, but it'll bolt very quickly. It's so yeah. hot. You're going to get one eat one one meal out of it, and then it's going to go right to seed. Um, what would you say about uh, curcubits? Um, Kelly's mentioning that they do not like transplanting, uh, but the spot in their container garden um, where they're planting to put cucumbers in is still producing its last legs of sugar snap peas, which were slow to start. So we're just wondering, like, what's a good time frame on this? Peas, I, peas it's not a great time. Um, they're, but they're, what about the cucumbers? Because it's less about the peas. The peas are on their way out, but they've got a slow start. Out. Okay, I'm sorry. That, well, that's an excellent place to put the cucumbers. Cucumbers, right now, if the ground is damp, and because we've had lots of rain, I heard that we've been keeping it, we've been hogging up all the rain and South Jersey's been getting none of it. So I'm very sorry about that. If we could send you some, we would, because we've got plenty, but the ground is nice and moist right now. And with the ground as warm as it is, and the, the sun, the days as long as they are, those suckers are gonna, you put them in from the seed, they're gonna jump out of the ground. You put them in and move back because that, that fast they're going to be out. So cucurbits, all your cucumbers, um, your pickling cucumbers, your slicing cucumbers, any of your, the long um, Asian cucumbers, all of those are going to jump out of the ground. So get them in from seed now. Get them in by the 4th of July. But again, look at the, um, look at how many days to harvest. Um, this is not a cucurbit. This is a, um, this is a cantaloupe and it says 80 days. So I'm still, I'm still going to gamble on, on getting these in and seeing how fast they jump up out of the ground. I, I have done both transplants and seed and I, for the cucurbits, and I find um, either one works. And um, by using the transplants, I know exactly where they are. Um, when I put the seeds in, it's a... It, there's a chance that the bugs are going to eat it before it gets big enough, but um, I just sow a few, a few extra seeds, and I find that they're within a week of each other of when they fruit. Um, and I've, I have a, I've had similar experiences. I hear people say that cucurbits don't like to be transplanted, but in my experience, that's overblown. I, well, I'm, growing, I'm growing some of the prettiest cucumbers I've ever grown from transplants this year. 
Yeah. I mean, if they, if you had them in a pot and there are six of them in a pot and you're dividing them to put in the ground, they hate that. They really hate that. But if you've grown them individually in pots, um, then you're just going right into the ground. And as long as you keep them watered, um, they should be fine. But what happens when they're in the pots and they get stressed because you went a day without watering them, they're going to try to bolt and they're trying very hard. That means they're trying very hard to flower and fruit before they get to full size. So you, what you're doing is you're planting an already stressed plant. And they hate that too. So um, get them in the ground from seed now. You can you still have time to do that. Actually, you could get um, get you could probably stretch the season to July fifteenth to get them in. Fourth of July is, but you could probably stretch it, uh, especially some of the shorter season pickle pickling cucumbers because they're they don't need they they start to develop fruit much sooner. Because we're talking about timing. I wanted to talk about putting in seeds right now. Um, remember I said dig the hole, water the hole, put some compost in the hole, and then put the transplant in? Well, I'm gonna do the same thing with my seeds. I'm gonna dig either my trench for a row or my, my hole. If it says a quarter inch, I'm still gonna go deeper because the ground, is uh, the surface is, is it's hot. So I don't want to burn the seeds out. I'm going to plant them a little deeper than it says to plant them. In fact, I would, if I'm going to plant beans, which I'm going to do after this class, um, I'm going to dig a trench a little bit deeper than I would put them. So I'm going to give it an inch or two, put some compost in the hole, water the, water the hole or the trench, put the seeds in, and then close it up. Because I'm not worried about air pockets with seeds. Um, what I'm worried about is if I water... Um, if the ground is dry and I water, I'm either washing away the seeds or I'm making the, the ground muddy on top of them, depending on how clay or uh, organic your soil is. I don't want to put a crust above them and have them have to fight harder. So I'm going to dig the hole or the trench. I'm going to put some, mix some compost in there. I'm going to water the hole or the trench. Then I'm going to put my seeds in and fold the soil in over it. Um, that's what I find seems to work when I'm this late in the season getting started. Um, what I can't stress enough, though, is that there is never a wrong time to start a garden. There is always something that you can be starting whenever it is that you get started. So don't be discouraged. It's like, I didn't get my garden started and it's the 4th of July. Well, you got a whole fall season ahead of you to get everything in. So never feel like it's the wrong time to start a garden. It is always the right time. So um, I wanted to make a quick mention of the other things that are going on in the garden right now. Um, and chime in on this, Cassidy um, and Nate. Right now, we are being inundated with spotted lanternfly. Um, the little guys, I mean, they're always here. They're always on my, walking across my monitor. They're everywhere. And right now they look like um, they're black with white spots and they are um, how big you've seen them. If you haven't seen them, you're not looking. Um, what are people doing right now to try to deal with them? A lot of different things, but the bottom line is, and uh, please chime in on this, Nate, um, the USDA admits that they don't kill the trees. They don't kill the plants. What they do is economic damage because they damage the fruit. So um, if they're on your trees, they can damage the fruit, but chances are next year they won't be there. We're, we're going to cross our fingers on that. I have never seen the volume um, of a bug like this since the... Um, gypsy moth back in like 1986 because Shauna was a baby um, when they ate all of the pine barrens. Pine barrens recovered but I've never seen this many bugs as uh, since then as I've seen the caterpillars yeah as I've seen of the um, of the uh, spotted lantern flies. So people are spraying them. They are sucking insects. So by 
That means we would usually use an insecticidal soap on them. Um, they are not chewing on things, so neem oil is not really doing it. Um, people are putting palm olive in a spray bottle and spraying them, not good for your plants. If, however, they're on the weeds, spray the heck out of them, because who cares if you damage the weeds? Um, I have them on my grapevine, that's a problem. I don't, I also have them on the porcelain vine, which is like a wild grapevine, and I don't care about that, so that I would spray the heck out. So do you need to trap them? Do you need to smash them? Do you need to kill them? Not really. It's just that we're so overwhelmed right now by them, it feels like they're a plague. So, um, um, do you know, Sally, do you know if any of anybody who's tried diatomaceous earth on them? I wonder if that works. Um, it's hard to get it on them because it's heavy. So, um, could you add a little soap to it? Little soap, not detergent, soap to it to make it as a sticker and then put it in a spray bottle, diatomaceous earth? Um, I don't know. I think it's but the powder. If you, if you have like a shaker like like talcum powder then you can shake it onto them as a dry powder we use that for a number of other insects and then on the plants and it seems to um use it on the plants especially when the bugs are on the plant but it it uh, as long as you do it between the rain you know after it rains it keeps things from going we have big problems with flea beetles which are little tiny critters and they don't like the diatomaceous earth but then also some other um, sucking it insects like Colorado potato beetles or munching insects like that. Yeah, okay. And, so uh, stink, okay, stink so we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna look into that. Uh, Young May, if you're out there, you look into that and report back next week, okay? And um, thankfully, you may, you may have the rain in Philadelphia this year, but South Jersey has no, We my part of South Jersey still doesn't have the lantern flies, so. Oh, like, crossed, well, away. I'll tell you what, if we're going to pipe our water to you, we're going to pipe you some, uh, some spotted lantern flies as well. Um, that sounds like a threat. <laughs> that, that, sounds like a threat. that was, a, that was a, an offer. It's like, okay, well, I'll, we want to share, so we'll bring you all of the stuff. Um, the other thing that we are, I mean, I am sprayed to where I'm slippery with, um, with mosquito repellent because right now, prime mosquito season and what are we supposed to be doing about that we got to make sure there is no standing water anywhere anywhere um because they are breeding in, there, there's a spotted lanternfly now walking across the top of my computer um uh we're trying to deal with the mosquitoes if you have water reservoirs that you cannot get rid of because it's um you know it's a small pond or it's your water barrel for your garden, you need to make sure that you're using some kind of um, mosquito bits or donuts or something like that. Something, this is a BT, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, I think. Um, it is a very simply dumbed down um, because that's how I explained how I understood it. It's a bacteria that they eat it and it makes them stop digesting. So the baby mosquitoes eat this, they can't deal with their digestion anymore and they die. So um, I have no objection to interrupting the life cycle of the mosquito because I, uh, get, I get chewed up and I don't like that. So we need to be dealing with our mosquitoes right now and this is one of the good ways. Um, we need to be as much as possible as we plant our new plants, um, like I'm gonna be planting squash probably tomorrow. And I get, um, I get squash borer in my squash, I get um, cucumber beetles in my squash, I get bugs in my squash and I don't love them. So what I'm trying to do, I'm gonna to try to be proactive. I'm gonna plant my squash and before they even come up out of the ground, I'm going to put hoops down and I'm going to cover it with insect netting to make sure that the adult bugs are not coming in and laying eggs on my, um, on my baby crops. Now, what's going to happen is as I'm growing, as the zucchini grows, the cucumbers grow, as all of them grow, they're going to get so big that they're going to not want to be inside the cages that I'm putting them in. Cages also help to keep the groundhogs out, not wood. 
Um, I want to keep them covered until they're well into flowering. And then I'm going to take the cover off because I would like the, the bees to be able to get in there and do the pollinating. So I'm going to get a few flowers on there. By then the plants are pretty tough and they can survive most anything the bugs are throwing at them. Have you found that to be, do you use, an, you're growing on a big scale, Nate, so do you use insect covers on any of your stuff? Um, I haven't in a while. The only times I think about it is when I'm trying to grow a brassica, a, a, a cabbage type crop, and we have terrible problems with the, both the cabbage moths and the um, harlequin bugs, which are really oh, terrible. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I've done, I've pretty much stopped growing uh, brassicas that I want to keep alive through the summer. This year, I'm even growing a rutabaga that I planted very early, and um, they're doing quite well. But my plan is to harvest them before the summer uh, bug season peaks keep them in the fridge, and then put them back in the ground for a little bit more growing in the fall and see if that works. Well, I have some, um, I have some like pest control questions while we're on this topic from the group. Um, so Julia is wondering about her potato plants, that the leaves are getting eaten um, and wondering what they can do for them. They haven't seen any bugs specifically eating them, but there's something making holes on the potato plants. So do we have any suggestions for Julia? That, that sounds to me like the flea beetle problem because flea beetles are very tiny. They're little black bugs. You might not notice them unless you look very closely, but they put little holes into all sorts of leaves. Um, that's what I use this product called DE for, or diatomaceous earth. And um, DE is a white powder. Um, you do not want to inhale it. It's very bad for humans if we inhale it. But um, so you want to, you know, wear a mask. Luckily, we're wearing a lot of masks anyway these days. So wear a mask when you're applying it and um, apply it after each time it rains. You're going to have these plants that have white powder on them that look kind of funny. But um, it's uh, it's much better for them, and the, I think that it dries out the bugs. If the bug gets exposed to it, it, it pretty much kills that bug. Well, but you don't want to use it all over. So it's all it's like it's very very sharp. Um, it has very sharp edges on it, which is why it irritates you if you breathe it in. And um, the reason that it works on insects is it works its way into their. I mean, like flea beetles breathe through the through their sides. They don't have noses. And it gets in their breathing apparatus, and it's really, really nasty to them. It is a, it is an organic, um, naturally occurring um, uh, cure for what ails you. The what I found in city gardens is um, that some, the old people. I mean, when I was young, <laughs> the old people um, used um, self-rising flour as well. Um, because um, they said that they would breathe it in and when it hit moisture inside the bug's body it would swell and um, and that would um, do do them in as well so um, but what I find in in urban gardens is any anything like that is also a theft deterrent because people think you have sprayed your um, sprayed or dusted your plant with poison and they they're much more less apt to, to want to take it so it's very dual purpose you're saying but very dual purpose yeah and as right. self-rising flower you know it's you've got it um so everybody's got it because everybody's baking these days so Darlene says that um their grandma used to use the self-rising flower for gardening yes yeah um yeah. so i have a few more questions about um about pest control. So Lisa's wondering about com companion planting borage as a squash bug repellent. True, false, any advice? I don't have experience with that one. Borage? I did share, last week I shared this um, companion planting list that I found that was really extensive. So I'll, I can double check that and reshare it in our follow-up um, email. I too. have seen um, borage, which is in the comfrey family, as a, as a trap crop for white flies and aphids. 
but I have not known it to repel any anything. I've seen it more used as a trap prop. So do our homework and report back next week. All right, and then the last one is um, Darlene is saying that they had a problem with growing cabbage and spiders hiding on the leaves and is wondering if lime is a white powder. Lime is a white powder, but if you have spiders hiding in the leaves of your cabbage, I would welcome them because spiders are gonna kill any other nasty things that want to eat your cabbage, but a spider is not gonna eat your cabbage. It might freak you out, but it's good to have. Spiders are great to have in the garden. Yeah, in fact, um, uh, one of the recommendations for, um, for natural pet pests drawing that, um, what is the word, beneficial pests is to put a bale of hay or a piece of a bale of hay at the end of each row because that's where the spiders live and they will keep, help to keep your, um, your, they'll walk down the row and do their shopping and, and take your bugs home with them and eat them. So um, spiders are a good thing to have. Um, in Philadelphia, because our soils tend, unless you're out in the outer reaches of like Oak Lane and Mount Airy, if you're downtown, mostly the, um, the soils are more alkaline because they've been exposed to lime from houses over the centuries. So putting lime in your garden is not recommended in, in the city proper. So putting lime on your plants can make your soil more alkaline when the soil is already leaning toward that anyway. So lime, I know that the old people you did lime, put lime on everything, but that's because they all grew up in the South and in the South you needed the lime. Here in Philadelphia, you don't need the lime to go with the self-rising flower or the diatomaceous earth as something that you're gonna dust your plant. But in the suburbs, you might you might benefit from some lime potentially. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll give the suburbs the benefit of the doubt. Now, Nate, you said you had to run away at five. Is this true? I'm, I'm checking to see if I do. I'm I'm seeing uh, if this meeting is happening. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick around and if you're somebody comes in, I'll have to while. go. Okay. Go. So um, we're right at five o'clock, and we um, at, if you've been to these classes before. This is the time when you can gracefully leave when no one will think you're rude. Um, so we're going to turn on all the mics and let everybody that wants to leave, well, let everybody, you know, yeah, like do a shout out and, and wave to everybody and say goodbye. And then we're going to get down and dirty with the, um, with the questions in the chat. Um, so what do we got going on in the chat? We got 75 questions in the chat. Did we already answer all of them? We've answered a, a solid number of them. Some lingering questions are um, recommendations on container gardening and keeping in mind that we are in fact doing a container Great. gardening workshop. So I can drop the link to register for that in the, um, in the chat. Also Harvest 2020 has a bunch of good information about container gardening for like beginner container gardening to um, container gardening with kids. So I can drop that in the, in the chat too, but do you have any just like maybe two quick tips that you wanted to share, Sally? About containers, this time of year, we need to be watering and watering and watering and watering and watering. And um, know that in your containers, um, if you're watering and watering and watering, you are washing the nutrients out each time you water. So um, for those, I know we had some, uh, some major miracle Grow fans in this group um, earlier, uh, in earlier classes. So um, now is when you have my permission to use miracle Grow. I know Nate's not a lover of miracle Grow. <laughs> At least they, they do have an organic line now, so I recommend you use the organic. If you're uh, going to use, um, if you're going to use Miracle Grow, Grow, use the organic one because it's not. I mean, in your containers, you're not so much, especially if they're containers that you're going to bring in later. You uh, want your soil to be fairly sterile, so you're going to have to introduce um, um, some kind of fertilizer. I use in mine. I use my worm bin compost. I I take a worm compost and then worm tea. The, the goopy stuff that drips out the bottom, I take that, I mix it with water, and I water my, my plants with that. Um, 
So that's all we use too. I recommend if you can find someone, a place that sells worm castings, they call it, or, or compost tea, that's what you want to use. Um, and be, before you check out, Nate, I wanted to, there was a question here about bees. And if you have beehives in your garden, what are your options for using pesticides? Um, if you have bees, you, you just want to be very cautious when you, when you, um, when you use anything. Just use, your, use any kind of spray very cautious, very, very tentatively. Again, I recommend only using stuff that's approved for organic um, for human health and for the health of the environment. But when we, when we apply anything, we only apply it to the part of the plant that's being eaten, um, the part of the plant that's being targeted by the pest. We only eat it when we see that pest and we only use it when we see that pest, when there is too much of that pest and it's really causing a, a problem that might kill or really damage the plant. And um, you, wanna, you wanna do it when there's not bees around. Um, if the bee is going to the flower of the plant that you want to spray, hold off on spraying that plant until the bees are done. Uh, chances so that would be evening or next year? It might just be a few days. You know, if, you're, if it's a, a plant that has flowers, the bees are only going to come when it's in bloom, and the blooms usually don't last very long. So be patient, hold off, and um, yeah, uh, if you are growing nice, healthy plants, you won't need uh, you you won't need to use very much spray. We use very very little overall. Yeah, there's um in the Harvest 2020 um, link, there's also information about um. I just lost my thought there. Duh. Bees and chemicals. Bees and chemicals. Um. Yeah, I lost it. Um. Oh, integrated pest management which means um, integrated IPM or integrated pest management is a philosophy about, um, about pesticides and pest control. And the first part of it is know your bugs so that if you are seeing something that you know that it's a harlequin bug and not a ladybug because they both are the same colors. And if you were describing them to somebody, you might get them confused. Um, so make sure that you know your bugs and do your homework to identify your bugs properly. Then find out when are the bugs most vulnerable because if um, if right now we're dealing with thousands and thousands of um, spotted lantern flies, if we can catch them in our traps, then they're not developing into the adults. So maybe they're more vulnerable when they're babies. Maybe that's when we're spraying them. Um, other disease, uh, other bugs um, and diseases are not vulnerable once they're established. So you know your bugs, identify your bugs, know when they're vulnerable, know what conditions set up um, more bugs. So know that you're going to get spider mites if it's really dry. So you need to make sure that you water more and you water, uh, water the plants, not just the soil. So knowing the cycles, knowing the time when they're most likely to be there. So like Nate said, he plants his coal crops early. He harvests them before the harlequin beetles get back. So harlequin beetles don't, I mean, so that is another way um, to deal with getting, you know, not having to use pesticides. Then you get to the, um, you get to where it's way bad and you can't deal with it because you missed this opportunity and this one and this one. And suddenly you've got a whole lot of bugs you use the least toxic pesticide that you can. You make sure that you read the label and you only use it for the things that it's recommended for. And uh, then, and only then, do you pull out the big guns because you don't want to nuke your plants for three bugs that could be the wrong bugs. You want to make sure that you've done all of your homework first before you bring out the big guns. And I'm going to, I am going to have to run now, but I was going to just say one last thing. So many bugs, especially at the garden scale. Um, it, if you're squeamish, you may not like to do it, but the best thing to do is squish them and not spray them. If you yeah, can, if you can collect them. 
Yeah. Put them. You don't even have to squish them. Put them in an old plastic, you know, in a, in a soda bottle that you've got that has a cap, and you can just put put the bugs in there and never think about them again. We have a sacrificial rock in our garden, where everything go. goes, and then you just or step on it. So, All right. um, so I got to run, but so thank Nat, you so much. Thank you so much. It's I'm gonna my pleasure. clap for you. Um, that's my that's my clapping. I, I do that too, but you know, right. everybody else muted. So Nate, thank you. Good luck with the, um, with the farm and good luck with getting your five, how many different varieties of sweet potatoes? Five, I think four or five. Yeah. Four or five. Well, good luck with getting them in and, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks Bye. everybody. All Bye -bye. right. Bye-bye. Patricia was asking a question about identifying bugs, and I think this is probably good for the group too, is like how to even begin on identifying a bug, like what's the process? And I think things that you can do are take a picture, take a picture of the bug, and you can always ask a gardener through PHS is one way to identify the bug. We can help you do that. Another app that people across the city have been using is iNaturalist where you take a picture, you upload the picture, and through crowdsourcing of other people that are also using this app, um, people will help you identify it. I think Patricia was saying that the bugs were on um, like cabbage and stuff like that. So I'm guessing it might be a Harlequin beetle. Um, so I would Google Harlequin beetles. They're not Harlequin they... beetles. No? No. no. Do we, do can, we, can we ask her to do a quick description? So if you can see this thing, it's- It's a June bug. It's a what? It's, uh, there are two, it's either a June bug or a grape beetle. A grape it's beetle. It's got spots, I, can, I can't see. It Let does, see. It's, light, it's light brown or rust colored depending on the, the bug. And they're only in my cabbage and collard greens and nobody at the food bank knew what they were. They are um, grape beetles grape beetles and yes. are they harmful and are they eating your collards and broccoli no but no, there's like a million of them yeah that's weird um it's a it's a weird year for everybody okay those are grape beetles and you could um you could look them up and see i mean they're not even considered um to be uh economically damaging to grapes so but okay, they so i don't need to worry about them commonly found on grapes, grapes. Okay. So you. check them out. Um, Stephanie is saying that Seek, S-E-E-K, is also a great app for species identification. And uh, they think that they are actually partnered with iNaturalist, which is the one that I mentioned earlier. So I would check out both of those apps. On Cassidy, they might be eating something on her plants. That's why there's so many of them there. So you might want to change their name to B. Be great, beneficial great beetle. Oh, oh, I like that. You know, why uh, are they there? They are related to the June bugs. Um, I don't know if you know June bugs, but we used to, they're about this big, and we used to take them and we would tie a string to their legs and we would fly them around. When we were, <laughs> I mean, it takes, you kill a lot of bugs to make a naturalist. So, um, I'm not going to feel guilt about that, but we used to, we used to fly them around because they were big, they were big and stupid and they would like fly into your face uh, when you were outside. So you would get them and you would, uh, and you can probably do that with them, but just please, you know, untie them when you're done. And let them. Okay, Cassidy. All right, Sally, do you want to talk about using coffee grounds as compost? People mention that a bunch in the oh, chat. Oh, I, uh, I do that all the time. I like, I like coffee grounds. They're, um, they break down really fast and they, my worms love them. Um, I, somebody showed up, somebody was at the Starbucks and they bagged them up for her and left, uh, they bag them up and leave them by the door and you can take them and put them in your compost. They're particularly good for, um, for uh, for worms because the worms love them and chew them up quickly because they're very small. You can also just throw them in your compost bin. Um, they are a, an okay source of nitrogen. Um, they are not, I mean, we used to say, oh, they're acidic because coffee is acidic. 
Um, and they would make your, if you wanted to acidify your soil, you would side dress, which means spreading it on the outside, um, on the surface of the soil and scratching it in a little bit, or you could use them loosely as mulch. But um, it, we found out that they weren't, although coffee is acidic, coffee seems to take the acid out of the coffee grounds. So they're not that acidic. So use them as compost, dig them into your soil, or feed them to your worms. I don't make tea out of them and water my house plants with them, although some people have suggested that. And it's like, why would I just not pour coffee on them? I, I don't want them, you know, staying awake at night. All right, and then in the same vein of composting, do you want to spread the good word on mushroom compost? Oh my God, mushroom <laughs> compost is the most wonderful thing. Um, I, we, use some, we use it a lot in the community gardens because we're close to mushroom country. So we have it available to us. It is a very good source of, um, of micronutrients and micro critters. And um, if you can get it organic, um, we use a company called Laurel Valley um, because Laurel Valley, the enti their entire process is, um, is organic. They don't um, spray an antibiotics on their, um, on their mushrooms, they don't use antibiotics in their soil so that the soil when they're done with their mushrooms is also still organic. So, um, and they've been certified organic for many years and we, we, love, we love them. What I, what I found is that um, the problem is though they will only bring you like 30 cubic yards or 20 cubic yards, so you need to buy a lot of it um, so what we have found is that many of the garden centers and landscapers around the Philadelphia area and um, Chester County do use theirs, specifically use theirs, um, so that you can get a mix of, um, of topsoil and um, mushroom soil from most of your, um, your folks that deliver smaller amounts. Sweet. All right. So next question. Hannah's asking, um, I recently got a few flowers on my jalapeno plant and they almost all dropped overnight, hoping to get some advice. Ooh, that could be two things. One, somebody's biting them and spitting them out. Are they the flowers disappearing or are they just falling off? Um, so if they're, well, it's hard to tell. Um, when your peppers are really finicky and if it's too hot or it's too cold or it's too dry or it's too damp, the flowers will not get pollinated and they will drop and they'll drop just like that. So, um, so what you want to do is to make sure that your plants are mulched and they're evenly watered and, um, and then you cross your fingers. Um, if, you, if you recently fed them a lot of fertilizer, they're, they're liable to drop their, um, their Hannah's, flowers as well. Hannah's uh, put what in the happens? chat, Sally, Hannah put in the chat that they're just falling off, that it's not like something eating them. Oh, okay. Well, then what happens is when they don't get pollinated, the plant chucks them because it says, oh, okay, well, this is, this, this is a crop failure. We're going to go on to the next ones. And, um, and so it will, may, it will always make more flowers. Um, that's, it, it's not unusual for that to happen. And they generally, uh, it's because there were, they were in crisis and they ditched them all. And then between that, this crisis and the next one, they'll put, they'll put more on. All right. So the next question is if there are any consultants that will come over to your house, see your setup, make suggestions for improvement, et cetera. Um, do you know of anybody that does that, Sally? I would imagine that it would be fee-based, like there would be a cost to that. Yeah. Um, well, it depends on if they're, um, um, uh, call your local garden center and ask. Because they'll or know. master gardeners. I don't know that master gardeners. gardeners would like come out and do all of that for you, but they might be a good resource to ask questions about. Oh, certainly. And you can also send that, send that request to ask a gardener because they would know. Um, it also depends on are you a community garden? 
if you're an individual gardener, it's going to be harder to get somebody to come out. You're going to end up paying for it. Community gardener, we might be able to get somebody out. So we need to, we need to know that. All right. The next question is from Deborah asking about tiny aphids on my dill plant is concerning. Can they be washed away with soap or vinegar after harvesting them so I can cook with them? Oh yeah, well that's all just a little extra protein, but yeah, a little vinegar, um, uh, vinegar and water will wash them off. You don't want to wash with, you don't want to wash your plants with soap, especially not dill, because it already tastes a, a little like soap. Um, no, that's not true. I love dill; it's one of my favorite herbs. But yeah, but just wash them off. Um, be careful that you. Did you say white aphids, or did you say aphids? I already deleted the question from oh, my no. post at App Sally. Um, I think it just said aphids, but okay. if you're still Make around, sure and that they're not black it. aphids. If they are black aphids, you need to look at them more closely because it could be that they are the eggs of the swallowtail butterfly, and you don't want you don't want to eat them either. But you don't want to. Um, so um, if that's what you're seeing, then then. Um, you think twice um, about whether you're even going to harvest or leave some out there to make sure that they're able to, we're able to grow our butterflies. All right. Um, do you have question or do you have any advice about container gardening with limited sunlight? Uh, greens and herbs. Um, fruiting crops are not so um, are not as easy when there's limited sunlight. But then um, you what are you considering limited sunlight? If it's six hours or two hours, if it's two hours, maybe you need to think about, um, well, greens and herbs. Um, and if it's less than that, you need to think about mushrooms because it is possible to grow mushrooms in your, um, in your garden, um, just on piles of wood chips and leaves. Um, Six to eight hours is enough to maybe get some peppers on or maybe some cherry tomatoes, but um, most of your fruiting crops need much more than that. So um, greens and herbs. Someone had mentioned in the chat that they found uh, small mushrooms in their, in a bag of potting soil, and they're wondering if the soil is still good to use. Oh, the soil is fine. It's just being broken down by fungus. Um, but don't try to eat the mushrooms unless you really know what they are. But as far as them being in, it's not, um, it's not uh, detrimental to the stuff that you're growing. It's just one more way that stuff is being composted. And then um, Jane is asking if it's okay to use rain barrel water on vegetables, which I personally say I use it on my herbs and I harvest and eat those herbs all the time and I'm still kicking relatively healthy um, in these days of COVID-19. So. Right. Yeah, it's like, you know, you pick your poisons. Um, the water department says no, you should not use it because of the, uh, the chance of E. coli, which means a bird pooped on your roof and the poop washed down into the water and is now in your rainwater. Um, birds also poop on your soil. Birds poop on your plants. Birds poop indiscriminately on everything. So I say wash your plants before you eat them. Um, I mean, if you're picking lettuce and you've been watering it with, it's not anything that's going to be absorbed up through the roots. It's just if you are using water that has E. coli on it, then you need to make sure that you wash your plants before you eat them, which you would do anyway. So I use, I use rainwater um, collected in rain barrels in my vegetable garden all the time. We use it in the community garden too. There are so many community gardens that rely on rainwater. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just some food for thought. Uh, Peggy is wondering, um, or they mentioned in the chat that they have a potted lemon tree that had these lovely lush flowers and then they all dropped 
and it doesn't look like any lemons will grow, is there a chance that they might get like a second flowering or oh, still yeah. get something? Oh, yeah. Um, they're like peppers. They just chuck out flowers randomly whenever they feel like it. So um, if you have lost your flowers, it's the same as with the peppers. They're, um, they're finicky and they got overly hot or overly cold or overly wet or overly dry. And they dumped their, um, they dumped their baggage and said, well, we're going to get rid of these and, and start anew. And they just haven't gotten around to it yet. So yeah, as long as they're happy where they are, they will put out new flowers. Hey, Cassidy and Sally, do you think that they didn't get pollinated and the, the person might want to take a little feather and do a little pollination? I don't personally know how the best way that, um, that they get pollinated in. I think that since we, um, we're so fond of orange blossom honey, that they get pollinated by bees. So if it's indoors and it's not getting pollinated, that's one thing and you need to do it by hand. If they're outdoors and the bees are all over them because the plants smell, the flowers smell so, so luscious. That, um, so yeah, do your homework. I am sure there are endless YouTube videos telling you exactly the best way to pollinate your lemons. So, and a feather, a feather is one of the methods, methods that I have seen. So do your homework, go out there and find out what are the best ways to pollinate them if you don't have bees to do it. All right, so next question is from Maxine. Uh, Maxine mentioned that they don't live in Philly, um, but they do community garden at a garden that's partnered with us through PHS. They're wondering if they can still get soil or I'm, I'm guessing maybe horse manure from, from parks and stables. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, as far as I know, we are st the um, horticulture center and the recycling center still have both. Um, so you can, um, I think we talked about this before, um, you can make an appointment to go to the recycling center and they will load you with compost or chips or whatever it is that you are asking for. Usually they do have manure there from the police stables. Um, if you are not using an open back truck, you can go to the horticulture center. Um, that's the one that's near the Japanese house. Um, you can go there and they're not checking ID at this point to know if you are in the, you know, a resident of the city or not. They're not charging. They're just letting you come right up to the piles. I don't know if they have piles of manure there these days, but I think that they're planning to open again in July. And at that point, you can go and collect your own stuff. But take somebody from the city that, you know, that lives in the city with you in case they ask you for ID that says you live in the city. Um, or I wonder if there's a way to just drop that you garden at a community garden. No, they ask you your address. They do? Yeah, they do ask you your address. So you just say, I'm just the driver. They're the... And, uh, and use their address. Or if you've got mail, you know, if you work in the city... Um, that if you've got mail to send to you at work with a Philadelphia address on it, you can use that too. Sweet. Um, okay. Sonia is asking about um, any advice on beginner gardening um, and what they should attempt to grow first. I think it's like, what, what are you, what do you want to eat? <laughs> what do you want to eat? And just try that and try and learn as you go. Um, and then I will say again, the Harvest 2020 program is really well built out for beginner gardeners. And there are a ton of links about like, what are things that are easiest to grow and how to grow them and spacing and all of that information. So Google Harvest 2020, I think I also put the link in the chat if you scroll all the way to the top um, and just kind of poke around there and you can find some good stuff. But also coming to these workshops because they're all meant for beginner gardeners. Yeah, yeah, and we're only two weeks in and uh, so we've got another four weeks to go um, on these. And then we'll, you know, we're still gonna be doing workshops after that. They just might not all be aimed specifically at beginners. Uh, questions about deer. All you oh, silly. geez. Uh, I'm saving those for Cassidy. Cassidy gets all the squirrel, cat, and deer questions. 
all the pest control questions. All, uh, yeah, the big pest controls. With uh, deer, just netting. It's, uh, I feel like it's the same for everything. Netting, people always talk about urine and blah, blah, blah. Um, um, this is what Mike McGrath always said. Mike McGrath from You Bet Your Garden. He said, eat a big steak dinner and then go and pee all around the edges of the garden because deer have very good sense of smell and they will read from your pee that you are a meat eater, a predator, and they will turn away. Unless they're really, really tame and really used to the place, in which case you have to confuse the heck out of them with netting. Uh, you, I mean, I've seen uh, netting as high as eight feet around a garden. And plus, plastic netting was enough to keep all but the most persistent deer out. But that means you've got to put up really tall poles. Um, right. Also, loud noises. People say playing the radio at night. Um, see the old CDs on a string so that they have pie plates on a string so that when the wind blows it rattles and, and, and frightens them. Okay, so uh, people are also asking for the information for the Fairmount Recycle Center to pick up compost and material. Uh, I would say Google it for right now if you're looking for an immediate answer, uh, but otherwise we can put it in our follow-up email. Yeah, if you were here for the, if you came for the soils workshop, you got it after, uh, I sent it to you after that. So go back and look through those, um, through that email. Um, okay, and Maxine is asking, or no, I think they're just saying, you can get bell pepper seeds and spaghetti squash seeds to grow directly from the store produce. Um, that they get 98% harvest growth from this? Um, I, I have found that the, um, I have had mixed results. I've had some really, really, really good results. I started doing it because I opened up a pepper and the darn seeds had sprouted inside the pepper. Did you find that out? Did you ever see that, Maxine, when it did that? Um, so um, I've also seen, it in, seen them inside um, tomatoes and inside squash. I've seen this seeds already sprouting inside. Um, you don't really know what variety they are, so you don't know if they're going to do well here in Philadelphia area, but um, if you, if they don't grow from what you've already, uh, you know, from what you would have thrown away anyway, you get your money back. Stephanie is asking about um, how to start worm composting, which is another thing that we're going to talk about in a, in a different workshop. So um, there is so much information out there about, um, about worm composting and starting your own worm farms. There are kits where you can do your own, you know, a DIY. Um, lots and lots of information out there on the internet. Um, what um, my favorite place to get worms is Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. Um, and you can find them online. I like them because they always get me my worms on time. They always come when they say they're going to come and they always have great sales. They also have lots of information on their website, um, including books and, um, and brochures. The, um, the book Worms Eat My Garbage by Mary Applehoff um, is the standard. It's the Bible that everybody learns on and then makes their own, um, uh, adds their own style to it. Um, so Uncle Jim's Worm Farm and Worms Eat My Garbage by Mary Applehoff. All right, and then um, Peggy is wondering if the city is still offering rain barrels that their old one is leaking and beyond repair. Okay, um, right now the rain check program is on hold because they've had, um, because they're city funded and they're, they've been drastically cut back to half of, half of their budget. So right now they're not um, offering new classes until they have fulfilled all of the orders um, because they got put on hold when the city shut down. So the city is, uh, so the group is just now re, restarting. 
So if you already had something on order and already did your training, then, um, then you will get served. And as soon as they are done, if they have any money left over, they will restart the classes. Um, as far as replacing one that is worn out, um, depending on what's wrong with it, if it's just the spigot, you might be able to get new fittings from them by just calling. Um, if, um, if it's the barrel itself that has worn out, um, uh, I, I'm not sure um, what their policy is, but um, that's another thing that you could, um, you could call the PHS, um, ask a gardener, and, um, and they will find out for you, or you could call the PHS switchboard and, uh, and ask for the rain check program. Well, so Maxine uh, was able to drop their question in yes, the chat, okay. uh, which this is a really great question. So if anybody else had issues with the audio or if you're not able to um, like make it one week, don't worry. The, all of the workshops that we're doing are getting recorded. Um, so our web team will be editing them to like get all of the the really great information, condense it down. And as soon as we get the links from the web team, we'll be able to share it out so that if you miss anything or if you want to be able to like sit and take notes at your own pace, um, we'll get those videos to you as soon as we can so that you can just have them for your own reference too. Yeah. Um, sweet. And then... Uh, we have another question about tips on growing birdhouse style gourds. Oh, those are fun. A um, couple of different things. Um, one, they are heavy feeders. So make sure that the ground around them is lots of compost. Um, you can still grow them now from seed. And um, they will, they will like I said before, they will jump right out of the ground and start growing. They need to climb on something. So plant them, give them a trellis or plant them on a fence or plant them on a tree, although they like to have a lot of sun. So not in the shade of a tree, but maybe on the sunny side of a tree. So they want lots of compost. They want to be able to climb. And then what you need to know is um, you're going to get a whole lot of nail flowers this is the same with cucumbers and, um, and squash as well. You're going to get a bunch of male flowers before you get female flowers. The female flowers, um, you can tell the difference between, because the male flowers come on a tiny little skinny stem, and the female flowers have a fat little gourd-shaped ovary behind them. So if it's a tall skinny flower, you're probably going to get a dozen of them before you get one with a fat, a fat base. And those are the ones that once they get pollinated, um, will make the fruit. So when they, um, when they, when you start to see the female flowers and you start to see the bees all over them, that's when you want to make sure that they're getting plenty of water because you want to give them that boost that it takes to form the fruit. Um, and then once the fruit is formed, you don't need to water, you know, to be as, um, you know, as, as fanatical about, about making sure they get watered. So they're heavy feeders, so lots of compost. Um, give them something to climb and make sure that as the fruit is forming, they're getting enough water. Well, so we have some questions about potatoes and container gardening again. So Carla is wondering if there are any specific sweet potato varieties that you recommend or that are suitable for container gardening. And then Maxine also dropped underneath that um, They've planted sweet potatoes from eyes that have grown from store produce, red and white potatoes as well with 100% um, growth to produce, which is awesome. Um, but are there any that you specifically um, recommend? I would say, depending on the size of the container, you want to have at least a five gallon pot for sweet potatoes, probably bigger. Um, and at that, once your container, okay, there's a variety called Bush Puerto Rico that doesn't run and it can grow in a five gallon pot. Everybody else, you want a bigger pot, but if you have a bigger pot, you can plant um, a sweet potato and let multiple plants grow. I have just buried a sweet potato in the ground in my garden, and it has grown several different plants out of, it's put out shoots and they've gone, 
And I have one particular one, um, my uh, Beauregard, who I've talked about before. Um, that one, that one puts up what looked like morning glory leaves. They went 12, 15 feet up into a tree. Um, so they took up a lot of space, but I had planted them near a tree and they went up into the tree and they were very happy. And then I got five pound sweet potatoes off of them. So um, a five pound sweet potato is, is as big as, um, um, almost as big as a, a quart, quart of milk. Um, so that's how big the pot needs to be. I'm pointing over there because you can't see my pot, but there's a great pot over there for sweet potatoes. And you can grow them from the sweet potatoes or you can break the shoots off and stick them in the ground and they will root. Um, there's another one of those crops where um, my grandmother used to say of plants like that, um, you could take a bite and spit it and it would grow. And that's what sweet potatoes are like. They're in the morning glory family and it's hard to kill morning glories. All right, Sandra or Sandra is asking about vertical growing, if you could talk a little bit on that, which is funny because that's what we did last week. Um, but any, any advice on trellising cucumbers versus green beans and just regular um, trellis ideas? Uh, cucumbers, um, do um, they grow tendrils? You know, they grow little these things. They grow little tendrils um, that will wrap around. So you can grow um, you can grow cucumbers on anything like string, wire. They'll wrap around and hold on to that. Beans will wrap the whole plant around something. So they like something a little more substantial. So uh, if they're going to wrap around. Um, They don't want something really big to wrap around. Um, so cucumbers, if they're going to get a lot of cucumbers on them, the plant is going to get heavy. So they need a more substantial um, trellis. And as far as height goes, you decide. Um, read your seed pack. If the seed pack says they're going to be, the beans are going to be 24 inches, then 24 inches is plenty big enough. Um, for a trellis, but um, for squash and cucumbers, those suckers may go 10, 10 feet, 15 feet. So um, make sure that uh, your trellis is big enough that they can go up one side and down the other and not pull the trellis down. Um, I've also seen, and I love this idea, and this is something I want to do with bamboo, is making a teepee out of it and letting the beans grow up so that not only are they growing up, and getting full sunlight all the way up, but it's great if you've made a teepee, kids, your little kids can go in there and use it as a little clubhouse. So that's where I'm going with mine. All right, and then this is the last question um, at the, in the chat. Darlene is asking about growing sunflower plants. Um, it's hard not to grow them. I mean, they're not, they're not hard to grow. Um, the hardest part is, um, Cassidy, you'll love this, uh, keeping the squirrels and the birds from eating the seeds out of the heads. So you plant your, your, um, your sunflowers and they, some of them will get to be 12 feet tall and you might need to stand on a ladder. But what I've seen people do is um, when the, um, when the flower head forms and you see this beautiful head, the seeds form behind the, the brown part, the middle part. And uh, once the seeds start to form, to put a, a plastic, not a, not a plasticky bag that's airtight, but uh, you know, uh, um, some people put um, the onion netting bag, you know, the bags that onions come in, the bags that potatoes come in, they put that around it or they put a paper bag around it, tie the bottom. You don't want to put plastic on there that's going to keep the moisture in and not allow airflow. So nothing more substantial than a paper bag. I've seen people use grocery bags that had holes in them and, and use that. But what it does is it keeps the squirrels and the birds from eating the seeds before they can uh, ripen and before you can harvest them. 
Okay. So that was uh, Lisa's also asking about a butternut squash plant, has two four inch baby squash buds, but no male flowers for them new to pollinate. Can I save them if they can't be pollinated uh, for bees to pollinate? Um, the, it, the butternut squash has two four inch baby squash buds. That's like this big. Big, that big, as big as my finger? Yes. So, um, and they are, oh, the buds. Okay, so the buds are that big. Like um, a, little, a little little squash with the flower, but no male flowers. Yet. Okay, um, are there other plants around? Because they don't need to necessarily be pollinated by the specific plant, by other flowers on the plant. So if you've got other squash, they can be pollinated by them. Um, if you don't have, um, you only have the ma the females and no males, that's very unusual. You usually have a lot of males. Um, if I have their male flowers, they haven't bloomed yet. Oh, okay. Well, then backwards. eventually they will even out. So, I um, mean, if you want to, as they open them, if they're not, if, they, if you know that there's no um, male flowers around, um, within a mile, because bees will travel a mile and they'll bring pollen a mile. Um, you could take advantage of those and stuff them and eat them. Right. Um, uh, and then wait for male and female to both appear on the same, you know, at the same time. Um, of course, you might develop a taste and then mm, can't, uh, can't stop you from that. Everybody go out, go be, go and fearlessly garden don't um but be careful and be safe and we'll see y'all next week when we're talking about raised beds so um bring your questions do your homework cassidy is a saint so she's going to send you out all of the things that we promise you um in, in short order so that you can uh you can do your homework um and put into practice everything you learned tonight so i'm done running my mouth i love y'all go garden and uh, see y'all next week. And Cassidy, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>